All right, guys. Well, here we are. It is another day now. Obviously. It's like, let me drop some knowledge on you. It's another day now. Uh, last night, I spent way too much time talking to the editor of my documentary. I hadn't talked to him in like a month. I was like, you're still like, you guys are still working on a film about me, right? They are. Um, I Like I said this whole time, I've been in the complete dark with how shit's operating. Uh, they don't, they just want me out of the way. Will De Los Santos called me today. He wrote Spun. So somebody in the back's like, you have AIDS. Um, and Will was telling me, he's like, look, bro, look, brother. You need to not be in the direct sunlight of the fucking project. It's like, what do you mean by that? He's like, there's life within it. And every time that you put yourself in between the light and the shade, there's darkness. I was like, are you using meth again, Will? He's like, oh, I gotta go. Pretty much verbatim conversation I had with him. I'm not even joking. That's like what kind of weird conversations I have with that fucking weirdo. I love him, though. I do. Love-hate relationship, for sure. But I got nothing bad to say about the fucking weirdo. Um, I do love him. And he really did have that kind of conversation with me. Basically telling me that, yes, in fact, it is correct that I need to distance myself from the project because it's the only way that it'll get done. So last night I end up talking to the, um, I end up talking to the editor of my film for, you know, hours, probably like eight hours. I, I literally like put the, phone on mute and like start beating off <clears throat> no you know what's funny though i have a friend that every time he gets twacked out on meth he calls me and he preaches aa to me every fucking like he's high telling me why aa works and he'll just keep talking and talking and talking and i will put the phone on mute i will set it on my dresser karina and i will watch tv sometimes we have sex and then I'll come back and grab the phone and take it off mute, and he's still like, and the kind of, see, the problem, Ryan, is that you haven't been exposed to the right brand of Alcoholics Anonymous, where I have. I was like, and then I'll like, energy, I'll be like, oh, the brand where you can smoke meth and then call your homeboys and talk about recovery, that brand. Well, right, right, right. And then he'll like, go right back into it, and I'll put it on mute, and this just goes on forever, for hours. It's ridiculous. I should start fucking recording it so you guys can hear it. You'll be like, what the fuck? The director of the documentary, Lucas, not to be confused with the editor, Avery, two different people. The director tells me that the cut will be available in two weeks. Two weeks. Remember, it was supposed to be the end of April. Then it was supposed to be uh, the first week of May. Now it's, give me two weeks. And what I said is I said this. I said, look, dude, I ain't no fucking punk. And come rain or shine, two weeks from now, we're seeing whatever you have. So two weeks from now, no matter what, even if it's not done by his standards, I'm going to have the cut to put up. And that's that. So that's one thing. Today, I woke up rather early as I went to sleep. You know, um, I have a herpes outbreak right now. So Karina and I can't have sex. And... I was like, well, do you want to have sex? And she's like, yeah, you have an outbreak. It's fucking gross. I was like, what if I wear a condom? She's like, that's gross. I was like, where? I was like, it's gross that you think condoms are gross. What about that? She's like, we can do it. I just want to suck your dick. I was like, all right, cool. Fuck. I was starting to think that you're lesbian or something. Way too much lesbian humor lately. I got to stop with that shit. Um, cause I have a lot of really good friends that are lesbians and I really honestly don't care either way, but I don't want to hurt their lesbian feelings. All right. Anyway. Um, so then I wake up and I got a check from my manager for 2,500 bucks. The check is for the documentary. So I've been collecting money in various forms from different people. I have some in cash app. I have some in PayPal. I have some in Venmo. I have some in cryptocurrency i have fucking money for the film in different areas and i have to pay the employees the people that work on it the editor the director 
Director costs the most. That guy is fucking pricey. I have to pay the editor right now. I have to pay him like two or three Gs. There's not really set money. It's like I pretty much just... Like we have contracts, so we have a specific number. For instance, maybe the editor I'll have to pay 20000 to, right? So it's not like I have to pay on this time, but I know that before the project's over, for everything to be legal, I owe the person $20,000. Then there's people like the director who's like, I want 5000 like at the you know, first Friday of each month. I want this, I want that, whatever. I'm at the point where I have to pay out the editor. I have to pay for all the different Adobe Premiere stuff. I have to pay for all this licensing shit. I have to pay legal fees. I have to pay all these different expenses. So it's like right now is the time of month where I have to pay that shit out. So for instance, one person that put money into the documentary sent me 5,000 in cash app. I owe almost 18000 to one person coming up in about a week. As soon as that cut's ready. So as soon as I get that second cut, I have to pay somebody 18 fucking grand in one shot. So I haven't touched that money at all. On that date, I transfer it all to that person. But before that, I have to pay the editor. And I just got a check for my manager for 2500 bucks. And it was from some weird ass credit union, like in like Northern California. I'm like, all right, I don't have a bank account. I wonder why. It's not because I was a junkie and I was trying to cash checks that were no good back like four or five years ago. And I got put on check systems and now nobody will fuck with me. It's not because of that. It's exactly because of that. And so I don't have a traditional bank account. Pretty much all of my money is in PayPal, Venmo, Cash App. <laughs> crypto wallets so when i get a ch and i rarely get a check even the when i option the screenplays those were direct deposits when i got paid for that it's like you'd get like three grand and they do like a direct deposit patreon gives me direct deposit into paypal google adsense which is for youtube gives me direct deposit into karina's uh, we have a green dot card for my book royalties just different shit right i'm a Let's go into Ryan's finances. That sounds fun. Sorry, I'm just venting to you about what happened today. This is bullshit. So I get this check for 2500 that I need to pay out the editor, and I also have to pay just like miscellaneous shit, right? I've had to cover money out of the dock, out of my own personal money, like 30, 40 times. And it sucks, you know? May not seem like a lot, 500 there, 500. But then I add it up and I've spent almost $20,000 of my own fucking money. And that's a lot of money. Whatever. I think it'll pay in dividends when the film comes out. But still, making a documentary is super expensive. I go to cash this at a check cashing place. The guy that's working there, all camo. He's like, we don't cash checks like that. I said, dude, you have a fucking sign that says check cashing place. You check cash all checks. This is what your fucking sign says. He's like, all checks except for this check. Is there a problem? I was like, no. And I just put my head down and walked out. Smoked a cigarette. He's like, I thought you quit. I'm like, shut up. I'm mad. So then, so I put it on Facebook. I go, how do I cash this? Somebody please tell me how to cash a check if I don't have a bank account. Somebody tells me that I can go to Walmart. Now, I don't go to Walmart a lot because it reminds me of being on crystal meth and sticking fallible objects in my asshole. Fallible. So the way you say that, phallic. Go to Walmart. Of course, everybody's tweaking except for me. I'm like the only non-meth person there. I'm like, hey. Anyone want to go take apart machinery in the parking lot? It was like, yeah, pick me. Walmart won't cash this shit. I'm like, are you fucking serious? Walmart won't cash it? What is this, some bunk check? I call my manager. I was like, oh, you're a piece of shit. He's like, dude. I'm dealing with enough right now. Boston George from Blow is on his deathbed right now. He's dying. My manager repped him. It's not even my current... That's my ex-manager. But he's still a producer on my film. I don't know. This is complicated. 
So then finally, someone's like, you can do check cashing on PayPal. PayPal has a check cashing option. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, doesn't work. Like I do the whole thing. I take the pictures, whatever. So I still did not cash the fucking check. And I still have not paid this $2,500 that I need to pay out. And that's stressful because then I have people sweating me, you know, I've, so people call me and they're like, dude, what am I going to tell my kids? No, we're, we're not going to eat. I'm like, dude, feed him canned foods. Fuck, stop being a bitch. Jesus. Get it to you when I can. Um, it just sucks. I don't know. No, I mean, I can cover it out of my PayPal, but still, fuck, it's 2,500 bucks that I should have. For the fucking funding to pay out to people that are working for me that I have to cover out of my own goddamn pocket. Sucks balls. Well, Santos is calling me right now. So should I do a mono or should I go right into a story? Because I know then there's people that are going to be like, eh, long, pointless monologue. And you know what? I'll just timestamp it because I got to get a video done. And if I pick up the phone, then I won't get one done. All right. So let's get into the story. So where we had left off last time is an interesting time period that I didn't talk about the first time I did the series for a particular reason. There's certain things that Karina just doesn't want me to talk about. And still, I'm so, I'm so thirsty. I'm such a greedy piece of shit that I'm like, fuck, I'm gonna, I don't care. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna say it anyway. I know you don't want me to, I'm gonna do it. So and that's where I'm at. I'm going to try to explain this story without going into details that I know she doesn't want me to talk about. So, one thing that's interesting about this particular storyline, and I don't know if people like it, I'm going to check comments tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'm going to be a big boy, I'm going to sit down, and I am going to check comments. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to wake up, I'm going to make some coffee, and I'm going to read comments, and I'll probably be... I'll probably be happy because I'm sure there's a lot of supportive people. And then I'll probably be upset because there's a lot of mad people. But one thing that's interesting about this particular storyline is this. For it to function correctly, there's backstories that are important. You know where we're at currently in the chronology of the story. Karina and I had gone down to detox, checked ourselves in. She flirted with the detox staff. It was a nightmare from the get-go. We finally left the rehab. We went to go boost wild turkey at Trader Joe's. Actually, I pretty much put her up to it because I was on federal probation. I was scared to get caught. That's what kind of guy I am. I'm like, why should I take the risk when you can? <laughs> if I get caught, I'll get in trouble. If you get caught, so you, but at least it won't be me. It's like that kind of mentality. We end up getting busted down at this Trader Joe's, and they're... Considering pressing charges, but they want the supervisor to ultimately make that decision. And the supervisor at that Trader Joe's is Callan, this girl that looks like a chipmunk that dated Jeff for like four years. She used to send me videos of her sucking his dick. And I'd be like, dude, this is not what normal friends do. And then I'd like send it to someone else. I'd be like, dude, look at this video I got of Jeff getting his dick sucked by Callan. It's fucking wild stuff. So we end up pretty much Callan because she's one of those weird control freak creeps. My sister did crystal meth. And now I smoke cigarettes because of it. She's like one of those people where her logic made no sense. And she decides she's not going to press charges on us at Trader Joe's, but she's going to make us go stay with her to detox. What am I saying? What would you do in a situation like that? I had no options, so I decided to go with her. I didn't think it was going to be as weird as it was. She had this boyfriend that was all into video games, and he was, like, mad that I wouldn't play video games with him. And I was basically coming off drugs and alcohol, and I just felt like, shit, we get kicked out of there. And um, Callan has us in the car. She has the GPS on. I don't think of it at first, but I finally asked her, so what, where are you taking us? And she's like, I'm taking you to the police station. Okay, so check this out. 
we're in this situation. It's a horrible situation to be in because she still has the power to press charges on us. It doesn't even matter, okay? Even if you're talking about in real life circumstances, in real life, I mean, if you're not on probation or parole, is it possible that you can get caught shoplifting and the person that is in charge at Trader Joe's, whether that be the supervisor, the manager, is it possible that they they don't press charges and then they change their mind and they can press charges on you? Probably not. But because I was on federal probation, it didn't matter. Police contact for me was a fucking violation. So that's why it was that big a deal for me. Before I met Karina, and this is very important to this particular storyline, and I'm going to tell you why. Before I met Karina, I had got, okay, way, way before her. I got out of prison in 2013. When I got out of prison, I was buff, I was tan, my teeth were white, my dick was still small, but my personality was bomber than bomb at that point. It's pretty much the bombest. I was the best rounded I was in my entire life. Intellectually, creatively, physically, emotionally. Well, maybe not emotionally, mentally. I definitely had lingering problems from prison at that point. But when I was on house arrest in the beginning of 2013, May, June 2013, if you remember how the story goes, when I was in prison, I had a, pay, uh, I had a pay, uh, pen pal. Her name was Gigi. She was like 19 and I was like 27. It was the youngest girl I've ever dated. She wrote me the whole time that I was in prison. I end up getting out of prison and I impregnate her almost immediately. Now, to this day, okay, I've always been a jealous, paranoid fuck. But to this day, I highly doubt that she was pregnant with my baby. Remember, she came and she would drive down from San Francisco down to my parents' house. She would get text messages and it would say, can you please send more naked pictures? And I'd be like, hey, who is that? And she's like, that's my friend Rachel from work. She's a lesbo. It's weird. But I knew better. I knew that it was a dude and I knew that she was cheating on me and it was just ridiculous. It was a delusional relationship to begin with. She had met me by being my pen pal while I was in prison. Like, what was I expecting to happen? Like, we were going to get married and, you know, it's like I'm doing my speech. I'm like, yeah, she wrote me while I was in the pen. We fell in love on an emotional level. And now we have this fairy tale, you know, wedding where... We ended up getting married because we really connected on a different level. I love you, babe. It wasn't like that. No, she was a psychopath. She was the kind of girl that would write like Richard Ramirez. And she'd be like, I know that you raped and killed women, but I can look past that. I just want to be with you. It was like that kind of person. To me, not at that point, because in that time I was delusional. I was like, of course she loves me. She loves me just because of my personality. It's just, it's that amazing. That's not what it was. She had this morbid fascination with me because I was um, a convict with a small dick. How do you survive like that in there when your dick is that small? I'm like, I talk my way out of a lot of shit. That's how I don't get raped. So she ultimately left me. If you remember, I got in this like weird hostage situation where I wouldn't let her leave my house. My dad was basically in on it with, with me. She's like, oh, she like ran up to him. She's like, oh my God, <laughs> Ryan's keeping me here against my will. My dad's like, well, you're going to stay here then. Ryan, start the motor. I was like, what motor? He said, like, I don't know. I'm your accomplice now. We have motors. I was like, all right. My dad really was kind of an accomplice in that. It's weird looking back on it. But anyway, it's neither here nor there. When she left me, when Gigi broke up with me ultimately because I tried to hold her hostage. And it was like, after that, I, tried, I was like, can you please forgive me? That was a one, that, I'll never do that again. It was a one-time hostage thing. Jesus. Overreacting. She didn't forgive me. 
she left me and I was just about a year sober, just about. I remember going into my parents, she left me and my fucking heart felt like it got ripped out of my chest. I felt like the guy in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, except I didn't have a whip or I wasn't an archeologist. It really was nothing like that, but it felt like my heart was getting ripped out. And I remember very clearly going into my parents' liquor cabinet and grabbing a bottle of wine, super dramatically. I was like listening to Blue October. I don't even like, I was like, yeah. And I put the bottle up to my mouth, started sucking on it. I was like, no, I put the bottle in my mouth and I went to take a pull and I had this flash of apprehension out of nowhere. I didn't want to do it. I was like, nope, nope. I, I have 11 months, 15 days sober. If I drink right now, I'm going to fucking throw it away. I'm not going to do it. And I don't know what happened. You know, I've become much more of a God person since Paul died. I believe in a higher power. At least I'll never push that kind of shit on you guys. But I believe in a higher power since he died at that point. I don't know if I believed in a higher power, but something stopped me from relapsing that day. I couldn't tell you what. Certainly wasn't just me like being like, wait, if I do this, it might have consequences. No way. That's not how I think. But somehow I was able to not drink. The next day. I was heartbroken. And you know how that is. You wake up, you're empty inside. You feel like catching a human in a bear trap and eating them just so you can feel something. You know what I'm talking about, probably not. And I remember I was on house arrest at the time, so I was very limited in how much I could leave my house. You know, I wasn't allowed to leave my house to do anything. There had to be a written itinerary and I had to have permission of where I was going to go. And I could only go to church or AA meetings. So of course, like my itinerary is like, yeah, I'm going to go to church three times today. Then I'm going to go hit about eight or nine meetings. And then I'm going to come home. Fuck, I'm tired. It's a day of healing. Shit. Just another day. And I would use that kind of fake itinerary to go and do whatever I wanted. So the day after she broke up with me. I, okay, Trina and I were talking about this the other day because we were fighting really, really bad. Hold on a second. Is he asleep, honey? Oh, that's too bad. We were talking about this the other day, right? And she was saying, because I, we were, I was at Preston's house and he had just gone through that breakup with Brenna. I mean, shit, I'm not gonna say her name. And Preston, basically, as soon as they broke up, he's like, all he wants is to get laid, right? That's it. He wants rebound. Trina's like, ew, I don't get it. When I go through a breakup, I need time to heal, right? Like, the last thing I want is rebound dick. I was like, that's all I ever want. I'm not, we're not even going through breakup and I want rebound dick right now. It sounds fucking amazing. It sounds athletic as fuck. When I go through a breakup, see, I think, I don't think I'm sociopathic. I really don't because I don't lack empathy. I do care about other people and I care about other people's feelings. But I'm definitely radically codependent. I'm the kind of person that needs a woman to validate me. Karina will just be like watching TV and I'll just like walk up to her and I'll be like, hey, babe. She's like, what? I'll be like, am I hot? She's like, no. I'm like, yeah, 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 no, I know, I know. I don't know, I was just kind of thinking, yeah, I, I thought not either. I'm gonna go, I gotta go take a shit. She's like, okay, all right, bye. You know, I'm the kind of guy that like constantly needs validation. So when I go through a breakup, because that's what relationships used to be for me. And that's incredibly unhealthy. But I used to look at relationships as a female validating me. That's it. 
So when that validation ends, I feel empty, but it's not because I had a connection with that person. It's because I'm missing the validation that that person gave me. It's some straight up serial killer shit. It's like the kind of thing where like years later, my neighbors will be like, yeah, I mean, you know, he was, he was he's kind of an eccentric guy. He had tattoos, everything. I didn't think he was capable of fucking killing his girlfriend and eating her. Yeah, that's weird for sure. But surprised, I guess, would be a word that I'd use. Surprised. <laughs> um, so I felt empty that day and I, and I was going and I was seeking validation. And what I did is I left my house and I went to an AA meeting and I went and I sat down and I had one goal in mind and that was to have sex with a girl. Well, a woman, not a girl or a man, a woman. I sat down and I looked at my prospects. There's like some gothic chick, like knitting a voodoo doll. I was like, I don't know. Chick looks pretty scary. There's like some middle-aged woman with like red webbing on her face. And I was like, huh, that chick looks like she would have sex for sure. And then I look and there's this beautiful girl. She's got like, you know, pink hair or some shit. I don't know. You know, this was definitely back when, I mean, I guess that still is a big thing. Karina has colored hair right now, but you know, it's like some girl with colored hair, puffy lips. I was like really creeping on this girl. And I made eye contact because that was always my move at the AA meeting. I would make eye contact and then they, you know, girls will look. And a lot of guys will just look away suddenly, but not me. I stand there and I just stare. I probably look like I, I probably look creepy as fuck. Especially the older I get. Like when I was younger, I could kind of get away with it. But like, old, you know, being a little older, I was a creep. But remember, I just got out of prison. I was in good shape and I looked healthy at that time. So I was, I was like living my best life, kind of. This girl looks at me. I just keep looking at her. And then she finally turns away. Now, I do not stop this stare down. This goes on for like three, four minutes. She finally looks at me again, walks, gets up, is in the middle of a meeting, somebody sharing. Some dude's, like, talking about how, like, he tried meth a couple times and let, like, a couple of his co-workers at the kitchen run a train on him. He's like, it was, I'm, a, I'm to be frank, I'm embarrassed about it, but, you know, but I'm not living like that today. Everyone's, like, clapping. She comes up to me. This is really weird. And she's like, hi. I was like, hey. People at the meeting are looking at this point. And she's like. Why do you keep looking at me? And I was like, because I find you attractive. Everybody in the fucking meeting is watching at this point. It's the weird, it's, this is odd. And I was like, because I find you attractive. She doesn't say anything. She's just looking at me like, like, I couldn't really read. Like, I couldn't tell if she was mad. I didn't tell if she was turned on. I was like thinking, I was like, oh, I wonder, I wonder if she's turned on right now. And she gets up and just walks right back to where she was sitting. This is after I told her I thought she was attractive in front of like everybody. It was really embarrassing. So I sit there. She does not look at me again. And I get up finally because now people are looking at me. You know, some guy goes to like pour himself a cup of coffee. He's pouring it kind of looking back at me he's like pouring coffee on himself and I could just tell that people were looking at me so I got uncomfortable and I left I left the meeting get up and leave sat on the curb and I smoke a cigarette I'm sitting out there finally the meeting ends people pour out of the meeting hall this is at Santa Barbara um um, what's it called? Um, 
God, why can't I think? It doesn't matter. The, uh, the Alano Club. It's what, like, the AA hut for each major city is. All these people pour out. And I'm looking for the girl. You know, I, I, like, it's one of those things where I don't know if I made a good impression or if this girl's totally creeped out and the Santa Barbara Police Department are going to come and give me some sort of restraining order. I don't know. It could be either way. And I don't find her and I'm bummed out. And I start walking down the street. Now, up the street from this AA meeting place is a Starbucks. I walk up there to get a coffee and I was really like bummed out. There's like all this anticipation, all this like build up. And I really thought that I really was thinking that I had a chance with this girl. I didn't know what her name was. I just knew that she had colored hair and I knew that it was kind of awkward what had happened, what had transpired in the meeting. I get my coffee and I'm leaving. Now I had kept my car parked in the parking lot of the Alano Club. Remember at the time I just got out of prison, I had like a 2008 black Chevy Malibu. It had like an Obama sticker on it. I'm a bitch, whatever. And I walk back to get my car with the coffee and I see her. She's in the parking lot. She comes up to me and she's like, hi. My name is Belle. I was like, I'm Ryan. She's like, gotta be honest with you. What she did at that meeting was not very cool. And I was like, can you elaborate on that? She's like, well, when I come to these meetings, I come here because I'm trying to get sober. I was assaulted three years ago at a party. I was like, listen, it's not like that. I honestly, if I'm going to be honest, kind of, I'm going through a breakup and I just found you attractive. Just think, do you want to walk to the pier with me? I was like, well, this is the thing. I'm actually on federal house arrest and I have to go home because I have to check in. You know, they would call, this is how it would work. I didn't have an ankle monitor on at that time, but I'd have to go home and I'd have to be there at, uh, like every other hour, I'd have to go home because I'd have to answer the landline. And that was how they kept track of you. You know, and that was back then. I've heard that now with like call forwarding systems that people have figured out ways to circumvent their system and that it's not working like that anymore. But back then I'd had to go home to check in every other hour, pick up the landline. They'd be like, oh, just checking to see if you're here. All right. I'm going back to AA. All right now. Bye-bye. That kind of shit. And she's like, federal house arrest. I was like, yeah. Um, I was a drug dealer. She's like, yikes. I was like, yeah. I was like, but there's nothing that I, I you know, there's nothing that I'd want more in the world than to go on a walk with you to the pier. Why don't you come with me to my house and then I'll go park by the pier and we can walk on it. She's like, I'm not getting in the car with you. Not after what she pulled in that meeting. It's like, what? Like, I, I was like, what the fuck did I even do? Like, it wasn't that weird, right? She's like, I'll go down there and I'll meet you by the dolphins. Dolphins is like some landmark in Santa Barbara. Go do what you have to do. And then we can go on a walk. I was like, all right, cool. She wouldn't give me her phone number. So I end up going back up to my parents' house. I check in, get on the phone, and I go back down there. Park my car. Now, in my mind... You got to understand, like, the mental state that I'm in. I'm 
totally um, frantic, you know, because I feel so empty because of this breakup. And all I want is to find a girl that I can have some sort of rebound sex with. That's it. I know that sounds grimy, but I'm just being honest. That's exactly like what my mindset was at that point. And so, of course, I don't trust women at that point. And I'm thinking in my mind that this girl's not going to show up. I go and I park my car downtown. And I go down to the Dolphins. Sure enough, Bo's standing right there. So I end up, it was really awkward. Like, I, I guess the reason I explained this story with, like, the dialogue that I did was just so you kind of know, like, what the awkwardness was like with this particular person, because it was weird. I end up walking on this pier with her, and she's real, like, standoffish. Like, you know, at one point I, like, try to, like, put my hand on her lower back. She swats it away. She's like, I just want to talk. I was like, sure. Let's just talk. So we're walking on this pier, and it's beautiful. You see the Pacific Ocean. All these people walking. People are eating cotton candy and ice cream cones and shit. And she's like, I really want to talk about my assault. And I'm sitting there, and now, listen, I was never raped, I was never molested, but pretty much every woman that I've dated has been. And I do have a lot of empathy for people that have been abused that way. The state of mind that I was in, this sounds awful, I don't know why I'm like going all into this, but I guess it's important because if you don't know the backstory of this particular person, what happens in Orange County really won't make sense or it won't mean as much. I'm just not really in a state of mind where I can listen or be of any support. Like I'm in this for one reason only. And I know it sounds bad, but that's just how it was. But I was already there. I only had like a couple hours. And I think that's another thing is that like, I felt this like impending sense of doom with the whole thing because I knew that I was on like a very short time limit. You know, I had to be back home in a couple hours to check in for the halfway house, whatever. So we're walking on the pier and she starts telling me this story and she tells me this story about how she had gone to this party and she was with this girl and she like, she went with her friend, these two girls and the girl she was with started arguing with this other girl and the other girl spit like vodka or hard liquor in the girl's face so the girl Bo that was with me ended up punching the girl that spit the hard liquor in her face and then her boyfriend punched her in the face knocked her out cold I was like did he rape you after that I'm like checking my watch and she's like no but he knocked me out he assaulted me I was like oh like fit like traditional assault oh well yeah that sucks she's like that's my trauma I was like damn it's horrible Surprise you're sober. I would never be able to stay sober if somebody hit me and I got knocked out. It sounds crazy. Are you okay? She's like, I am now. Let's go. I was like, what the fuck? This is like the, one of the weirdest people I've ever met. So I hang out with her the rest of that day or whatever small amount of time I had to hang out with her. And I ended up buying her like an ice cream sundae. We're eating it. She's like, sometimes I can smell his cologne. I'm like, who's cologne? The guy that assaulted me. I thought she was fucking with me or something. I was like, oh. So I was like playing along. I was like, that sucks. 
I'm really sorry to hear that. And she's like, you know, it's just been really hard for me to trust anyone ever since because I think that I'm going to get hit again. I don't want to get hit again. To be honest, I just want to have sex. He says this randomly. I was like, huh? I was like, well, <clears throat> this is like the weird thing about this. I thought that this whole time that I was hanging out with her was like a waste of time, right? I'm like, well, you're in luck. Because that's how I heal. That's how I express myself sexually. Sometimes, sometimes I have sex and rhyme even. She's like, yeah, I want to. She, that's pretty much why we're hanging out, right? So you can fuck me. I rarely get turned off, right? I mean, I'm a scumbag. I'm a pig. Or whatever. But this particular girl really fucking freaked me out. I don't know why. But I didn't want to have sex with her. And it was weird because I was in this weird ass state of like needing that validation but it was the way she said it i don't know it made me feel like a scumbag like more so than normal and so i was like well and i was trying to like put it out of my head you know i was like all right well How, you know, I got to go home and I got to go check in to the half house again because now hours have gone by. How do you want to do it? Do you, do you live, you got your own place? She's like, I live at a sober living. I was like, oh, that's right. You're in recovery. I was like, what's your drug of choice? She's like, she's just shaking her head. I was like, what does that mean? She's like, I don't have one. I'm just scared of getting assaulted again. So I stay there because it makes me feel safe to be around other addicts. They know what it's like to be assaulted too. I was like, oh, okay, you're crazy. That's cool. I was like, all right, well, can I have your phone number? And she's like, no. But there's this place we can meet. It's downtown. And it was this, like, um, I don't really even know how to describe I don't remember what she even called it, but it was, like, storage shed area. Where there's, like, these storage sheds on the beach. When I was a kid, I, we used to, like, there was, like, these gaps on the roofs that we used to skateboard across. And she wanted me to meet her by there and basically have sex with her on the beach. Said that I would. She wouldn't give me her phone number. I never showed up. I don't know why, I just did not want to. It was a really weird interaction. Just the whole thing, like how she'd come up to me at the meeting, and then this whole story about how she'd been assaulted, but like, I thought she'd been raped, but she hadn't. But it was just, it was a weird ass thing. So I didn't, I didn't do anything with her. Around that time, right? And I know you're probably like, what does this have to do with what you're talking about? But it, it actually does. All of this has to do with what I'm talking about right now. That's why it's kind of a weird series, because it kind of, like, dips back into, like, the origins of certain characters and stuff. Around that time, stuff like this was happening to me quite a bit. Where girls would hit me up randomly on Facebook Messenger and basically ask me out on dates. Kind of. I don't know. It happened to me, like... A handful of times. That's how I met Karina. Karina, when we got together, is because she hit me up on Facebook Messenger and was like, hey, I always see you dating bimbos. Why don't you take me out on a date now that you're single? And now we've been together for like 40 years and we don't have sex anymore. And we role play. Pretend that we're members of the opposite sex. She's Todd. I'm Barbara. So, No. No, we're, we're happy. But occasionally I'd have girls that would hit me up randomly on Messenger. So this girl, I don't, I do not want to say this fucking girl's name. 
And this is part of the reason Karina didn't want me to tell the story about Callan. It's kind of complicated, but what can I make up this girl's name be? Allison. I end up getting a message one day from this girl named Allison. Now, at that time, I was 27 years old. This girl was like 35. She was about the age that I, she's like the same age I am now. She hits me up on Messenger and she's like, hey, I've noticed you and I want to get to know you. Basically like code word, like, hey, I think you're good looking. Let's fuck. I'm like, I've noticed you too. No idea who this person was. So we strike up this conversation. This was probably about two weeks after, maybe even sooner than that, after I'd gone and walked on the pier with that girl, Bo. So we like start up this conversation. Now, right off the bat, this girl, Allison, is, is super weird. She's like an X-Files fanatic. She knew that I was friends with Chris Carter, who created the show. How she knew that I knew him, I don't know, but I'd known him since I was a kid. And that was one of the first things that I thought was odd is like, she knew that I knew this person that was kind of like a childhood family friend of mine. She starts talking to me, she's in recovery. And I guess she's like a big recovery figure in Santa Barbara. Now at that time, I'm in AA. I have a sponsor. Sponsor is the drummer of a very, very, very well-known band. I, he's actually a person that definitely would not want me to put his business out there. But he was my sponsor and he was a fucking weirdo sponsor. And one of the things that he was tripping on at that time was that I was going around and sleeping with too many women in the program. And he's like, he would say stuff like this. He'd be like, hey man, we didn't get sober to be pieces of shit in recovery to girls. I'm like, how am I being a piece of shit? Having sex makes me a piece of shit? He's like, yeah. Is she not in love? I was like, dude, we're not living in 1930s Berlin, dude. Like, chill out. <laughs> so... With that being said, as soon as I start talking to this girl, Allison, she is good friends with my sponsor and she tells my sponsor that I'm hitting on her. This is a girl that approached me, that hit on me, that pursued me. And I'm, I mean, I'm not going to just be like, oh, yeah, no, oh, sex gross. Yeah, no, I don't, I, I, no, I haven't been locked up for five years. I'm cool. I'm just going to beat off tonight. All right, cool. Send. I was pretty much entertaining any, uh, prospect that came my way at that time. So, and she was very aggressive and she started saying things to me that I thought were fucking absolutely disgusting. She told me that she had lived with a meth dealer. And she said that the meth dealer and her had raped women together. Literally, like, threesome raped women together. She told me that. Not something she was, like, acting like she was proud of. But I got the impression that she was, like, trying to, like, sound like the biggest freak ever. I rape women. That's how hardcore I am. This is a girl telling me that. that shit grossed me out, right? This is a girl that I just did not want anything to do with pretty much after she had said that it's weird she the x-files thing talking to my sponsor saying that i was hitting on her basically like bragging about the fact that i was having inappropriate conversations with her shit like that right so and then when she told me the thing about when she was a tweaker she used to rape women with her boyfriend who was a meth dealer kind of just pushed me away I don't remember 
why. But for some reason, at one particular time, I don't remember, I just cannot remember what the fucking reason was. But somehow, I end up going over to her place. I think maybe I was like out on like one of my passes. And I didn't have anywhere to go. I don't remember what the reason was. This is like after I had already determined that I didn't want to do anything with her. Because she just creeped me out on, for, on a number of different levels. But I went over to her house. And in my mind, I was like, all right, I can go over there. And I can do nothing. I don't have to have sex or anything. Just go over there. I, maybe she was like offering to feed me or something. I, I just don't remember what. There was some reason why I went over to her place in a, like a platonic way. So I go over there, and of course she's watching the X Files, and it, it's not a bad looking girl by any means. Like I don't want you to like get this like weird impression that it was like some like hideous looking person. It was just the things that she said. I mean, you tell me that you assisted in raping someone I don't give a fuck who you are like that shit just disgusts me and so I go over to her place and she's wearing this little like nightgown type thing it's like three in the afternoon she puts on x-files and she's just like yeah just make yourself at home what kind of food do you like is that she was making me dinner I remember correctly and she had a bunch of different options for me so I'm sitting there on her couch watching X-Files and she comes out of the kitchen. Like she was the kind of thing where she was having a conversation with me in the kitchen and I'm sitting like in the living room. And she's like yelling shit back and forth. And she walks into the living room butt naked. And she's like, do you like this? Now, I'd already, in my mind, I was like, I am, there's, I'm not fucking this girl. There's no way. I rarely can't remember why, but there's a reason why, why I was over there. I just don't remember what the reason was. But it doesn't matter. So now she's standing naked in front of me. And I just decided to fuck her. I was like, eh, whatever. I'm already here. I mean, it's more trouble to think of a reason to leave. So we end up having sex. And not to get too graphic, but I'm not even joking. I butt fuck her. Super random. Like some random butt fuck incident, right? And when it's over, she goes, so we're boyfriend and girlfriend now, right? And I say, no. I say, no, what? I said, no, what are you talking about? That doesn't mean anything. This was meaningless. What, what the fuck? And she's like, you tricked me. You said you like X-Files. I was like, I do like the X-Files. What the fuck, dude? weirdo and I remember getting my clothes and leaving I remember walking out of there and I didn't even have my shirt on I was like weirded out by the whole situation so shortly after that I start get hearing all I start getting weird phone calls not from her but from like other guys that I know from AA yo Ryan yeah, this is like messages I would get yo Ryan it's Jonathan hey man uh, heard you were threatening suicide over some girl, Allison. Um, it's not worth it, my dude. It's not worth it. You almost got a year sober. Uh, hang in there. Next message, it would be like, hey, it's Angela. Um, I heard you were dead, and I'm just trying to see if it's true or not. I've always liked you, Ryan. I gotta go. It's getting these weird messages, and she had been going around telling people that she, first of all she told people that i died which is fucking weird if you think about it and she was telling girls in the aa program that i threatened to kill myself if she wouldn't be with me and she didn't want to be my girlfriend 
complete opposite of what the truth was. The truth was is that she had asked me to be her boyfriend and I said no. She starts making up all these weird rumors about me. Then that girl, Bo, that I had met that one time, the girl with the colored hair that told me she had been assaulted, that girl ended up being Allison Sponsy. Allison was sponsoring this girl, which was like, oh, that's perfect. You know, two women that I had like weird interactions with. Now this girl, Alice, or the girl, Bo, the really weird girl, told Allison that I fucked her that night. And I didn't, I never even went up and met up with her. So she made it up. She said that I had sex with her that night and I didn't. So now I get this reputation around Santa Barbara AA that I am this like womanizing pig that just goes around and manipulates women into fucking me. It really wasn't true. It was actually two central girls, Allison and Bo, they were both making up weird ass lies about me. I never slept with Bo and Allison, I didn't want to be with, but she told everybody that. You're probably wondering what any of this has to do with the current storyline that I'm talking about. It's very important that you remember these two characters. Allison, the girl that made up all these very strange lies about me, 35 years old, X-Files fan, and her sponsee, Bo, the girl that said I had sex with her when I didn't, the girl that had made the big deal about getting punched at a party. And we will get back into how this all ties into the current situation with Callan in the next installment of the Henry series. Thank you, guys. Palabra.